minute or two. All right, it is four o'clock. And it looks like everyone's in from the waiting room right now. So I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, I'll share some intro information um, and maybe some other folks will trickle in. Um, so thanks everyone for being here. Um, this is uh, Lessons from New York's Agricultural Environmental Management Program. Um, I'm Katie and I'll be helping to facilitate and uh, make sure things go smoothly today. Um, just a few quick reminders before we get to the presentation. Um, oh, and also Bethany is here and will be able to help with any tech questions that may arise. Um, so feel free to chat her directly if you have any questions. Um, so a couple of reminders, uh, please remain muted with your video off during our presentations. We do have closed captioning on, it's not perfect because it is auto-generated, but um, you can enable that for yourself. Um, it is, this workshop is being recorded and we'll share it uh, shortly after the presentation today um, on the conference website and mobile app. Um, the chat box is live, so feel free to introduce yourself. You can ask questions for any of the panelists today um, throughout the presentations, and then uh, we will take questions at the end also. Um, and our uh, annual winter conference wouldn't be possible without the support of our sponsors. Um, we'd like to specifically thank um, our app sponsors, Hudson Valley Farm Hub and Honey Dog Farm. And you can learn more about those organizations and their work um, by visiting them in our marketplace or online. Um, so today I'm joined by Greg Albrecht uh, of the New York State Department of Ag and Markets. Lee Braggs, I'm not sure if Lee's joined us yet, but um, with Murray Street Community Garden, Klaus Martins of Lakeview Organic Grain, and Becca Rimmel of Bottomland Farm. Um, and so thanks to the advocacy and input of New York's farmers, including probably many of you on the call today and many in NOFA's community, um, New York has committed, New York State has committed support to um, help farmers in building soil health and adopting climate resilient practices and systems of agriculture. Um, and the state's commitment includes funding for research and programming to advance soil health and climate resiliency goals for the agricultural industry. Um, and today, Greg is here from New York State Department of Ag and Markets to share uh, kind of an overview of the programming that's available um, to farmers throughout the state through their local soil and water conservation districts. And Becca Lee and Klaus are here to share their stories about um, how they've worked with, with their local districts on planning and on um, implementing projects. So it's my hope that today's panel will give you just a taste of the offerings that are available and how you can get the most of them. Um, so first we'll hear from Greg, who will share an overview, uh, then from Becca, Lee, and Klaus, um, who will each share more about their work. And again, we'll have time at the end for Q&A, but please feel free to use the chat box throughout. So I'll turn it over to you, Greg. Maybe, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to uh, Noah from New York for the opportunity to present this afternoon. Um, I will be brief, uh, but uh, there will be uh, always opportunities to reach out to me or perhaps even more importantly and specific to your farm and, and future work in ag environmental management is with your local soil and water conservation district. So I, um, a little bit of a path roadmap for today is I'll give a quick inter overview of agricultural environmental management, but then really get to the main event uh, with um, the experiences within ag environmental management or AEM from uh, Bottomland Farm, partnering with Tioga County Soil and Water Conservation District. And I see Danielle Singer on the line here from the district there. Uh, Lee Braggs with Murray Street Community Garden, partnering with Warren County Soil and Water. And I also think I saw Nick Rowell uh, from the Warren County District. And of course, uh, Klaus Martins and his experience in working 
with AEM and being a leader with from Lakeview Organic Grain and Yates County Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, farmers, uh, you know, like this and their stories and their experiences, uh, which I should say we have a really nice cross section here of uh, various uh, um, number of years working with districts and types of farms um, are, are really what makes agriculture in New York so special. Um, we live in a pretty incredible state with an even more incredible um, farming community that, you know, often if we're talking with uh, non-farm neighbors, you know, they may think of the things that farms produce as food and beverage, horticultural products, fiber, forest products, therapeutics, energy, you know, all the things that, that farms make and put on the market. Um, but there are so many other things and benefits that well-managed farms deliver to society. And I, I like to start AIM presentations with just acknowledging that uh, in the economic impacts and jobs, uh, the environmental uh, benefits of agriculture, and of course, you know, things like quality of life and tourism that just make a place a nice place to live and, uh, and do work together. And it's those elements that are really fundamental to the organize, organization of agricultural environmental management uh, back in the, in the 90s and into fruition and practice starting in the year 2000. Um, ag environmental management is locally led in your county by soil and water conservation districts, of which there are 58 districts serving all areas of New York State. Um, that's slightly smaller than the total number of counties because there's some grouping of counties uh, in, the, in the metropolitan New York area into one soil and water district. And they've been doing it for a long time. Uh, AEM, again, was put into play about 2000. But soil and water districts got their charter in New York state law in 1940 with the soil and water district law. And that was you know, soon after you know, FDR signing in the concept at the federal level of soil conservation districts um, in response to, to soil erosion losses with the Dust Bowl. Uh, and they've been doing these efforts with farmers for soil, water, and other natural resources conservation ever since. And AIM is uh, a more relatively recent. Now we're you know, 23 years, I guess, officially since it's been codified into law. Um, um, next step in that, if you will. It has basic uh, fundamental elements that it's open to all farmers. It is voluntary, it is incentive-based, and it's adoption-driven. It's driven by uh, what the farmer decides on and, and desires for the viability of their farm and also the protection of natural resources for, through their farming activities. It's consistent and based on uh, science-based standards and practices and guidelines for planning activities, which lead to prioritization of interest by the farm and practices and prioritization for investment from the farmer's budget, as well as from um, public sector cost share programs, all of which I'll describe a little more in coming slides. And um, that all is aided or, 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 or um, done with the, the goal of implementation and long-term adoption by the farm. And with that, we realized uh, with, with AIM that technical assistance uh, with the Soil and Water District and potentially other partners is really critical in working with farmers to help identify opportunities, plan and design practices to realize them and, and then adopt them. Equally important, perhaps most important, is that it's focused on building trust and relationships um, with farmers and, and others in the community. Uh, it's not a sort of, uh, you know, a point in time interaction and that's it and that's done. It's, the, it's really set up so that farmers and soil water districts and other conservation partners can work together for the long haul. Um, one part of that that's actually based into the, uh, the AIM law is that those interactions, those technical analyses with the farm are held confidential, very similarly to how um, it is in, in uh, USDA programs like with NRCS. And that's just done so that um, districts and farmers can meet each other where they're at and have good candid conversations about existing conditions on farms and interests 
and make those technical um, uh, um, plans to, to um, build upon them. And I talked a lot about a process and plans and prioritization and, and, and you know, meeting people where they're at. And that's uh, summarized in a consistent approach that we call the AIM five-tiered approach. And this is kind of what it looks like if you haven't um, connected with your soil and water conservation district yet, this is what it looks like to work with the district on AIM. Um, it starts with a basic inventory, very simple questionnaire about a little bit about your contact information and uh, about your farm and your interests for your farm, for conservation, for, for anything. Districts are good at taking notes and, 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 um, and tracking that so they can be more responsive to um, a plan that is of your interest and, and of a value to you. The next step is tier two, and that's an environmental assessment, which is deliberately uh, designed to do two things. One, uh, acknowledge and document the existing environmental stewardship of the farm, as well as identify environmental resource concerns and opportunities for improvement. And then that quickly leads into conservation planning. And on the slide, you can see several uh, type, different types of conservation plans and scales all the way down to like the small management unit, like for instance, your pastures or your cropland, or it could be at a whole farm scale. And districts are prepared to you know, work with, with farms and based on their environmental review and the farmer's interest, decide which plan would be the first best type to start with. And then that leads to um, the, the planning and design of conservation systems that are the highest priority for the farmer and, and the environment. And those come in many different types. It's the whole range of NRCS conservation practice standards. So stream corridor buffers, covered crops, nutrient management, composting, reduced tillage, irrigation, prescribed grazing, uh, more farmstead focused practices to help organize and better capture um, nutrients that, that might be uh, developed, for instance, from a, a beef or a dairy herd to then recycle as fertilizer on the crops. Um, stream corridor practices, wetland practices, uh, and, and a whole host of field um, soil and water conservation practices that may even be more structural in nature, like grassed waterways and whatnot. So it's the full range. And the, the planning process here is meant to help get the best sense for the farm and the best sense from the farmer, and then prioritize in those interests, and then prioritize the practice systems that are of highest interest to the farm and for environmental management that might have the best potential for cost share funding. And I'll get to that in just a sec. And the last tier is really important. And this is part of that long-term relationship and that trust is, you know, districts want to follow up and see how practices are working. What could have done better? Um, could operation and maintenance be done a little better? Um, hey, we did this conservation plan. Um, there were other priorities that we haven't implemented yet. Shall we maybe work on those next? Um, and, and live and learn and update plans so that we can do a better job, not only with that farmer that we're working with, but also with other farmers um, and, and, um, and when we uh, plan and design these practices. Okay, so you're hopefully getting a quick sense here of, of the lead up to you know, having a, some conservation practices, some farm management practices that are well-planned it makes sense for the farm, you know, it's kind of to a point where it's, it's, you know, a sure thing. I know what it looks like. I know what you're telling me, Soil and Water District. I can, I can see it. I understand it. I want to do it. How do we fund it? And the soil, the um, New York State Department of Ag and Markets and the Soil and Water Conservation District are uh, fortunate to um, have funds through the New York State Environmental Protection Fund on an annual basis to do just that, to help invest in cost share in these conservation practices that have been developed through this AIM five-tier planning approach. And all of them are locally sponsored by your solar and water conservation district. So they're your local face. You know, I'm, I'm just a guy from the state, right? 
Um, they're the, the local sponsor and face of these programs and the leads for them. And I'll just take a couple of minutes in, in talking about a, a few of them. But first, I do definitely want to acknowledge that certainly that's not the only game in town. And uh, our partners at um, USDA NRCS and FSA and, and other programs in the state you know, are there as well. So we are different from NRCS, the Solomon Water District is. Uh, but very compatible. And in a place like New York, uh, offers very significant funding. And last but not least, um, farmers are doing conservation work every day, and that involves an investment. And even in our programs, they're cost share programs, so there's a financial investment there. So that's really important for us to acknowledge that commitment from farmers. Okay, quick step through of three practices here or three programs of the suite that we offer every year. One is called the AIM-based program, and it has two components. One is kind of invisible to you in that it provides funding to help soil and water districts work with farmers on those five technical tiers of AIM. That's so that you don't have to pay for an assessment or a conservation plan or a design, right? In some cases, uh, design that the, um, um, except for you know, the time and, and effort that you'll put into it, right? The, uh, the other part of that is a small cost share uh, program that's non-competitive at the state level, but, but uh, through a ranking process at the Soil and Water District, which allows for some cost share funding uh, on, a, on a modest basis of about $100,000 every two years with a max of um, $50,000 per farm. And I'm the coordinator of that particular program. So if you have questions, please reach out to me or your soil and water district. The next two are much more, much more significant. And this one, the Agricultural Nonpoint Source Pollution and Abatement Control Program um, is our longest running. And that is focused primary, primarily on soil conservation and water quality and can support planning grants as well as the implementation of BMP systems that have emerged as priorities from your AIM tier three conservation plan. Again, they're uh, sponsored by your local district. It's been running since 1994 on an annual basis. And as of round, our most recent awarded round 28, it's about 20, 240 million. It is a competitive program. So once you've uh, developed a conservation plan and there's a priority, you know, set of practices that you're really keen on implementing, you'd get with your soil and water district. When the RFP came out, they, they would submit an application for funding um, and, and put their best foot forward, but realize that we get about twice as many applications as we're able to fund every year. And that's even at a uh, budget amount that often hovers around 12 or $13 million a year. So a lot of good projects being put forward with farmers by districts uh, for this program. It cost shares up to 87.5% from the state. So that's 12.5% for the farmer, which can be in kind or cash. And its program manager is Bethany Bizdu from, from our shop. The last program I'll describe is called the Climate Resilient Farming Program. This is a little uh, earlier. It's, it's about to enter into its seventh round, but based on the work of farmers and soil and water districts, we've been awarded funding for it every year, and it doesn't seem like that's stopping, knock on wood. Um, the goal here is to build climate change adaptation and greenhouse gas mitigation um, within um, this AIM process, and not ignoring, you know, in many cases, in most, the water quality and soil health benefits that come along with those pursuits. Um, this has a different architecture from the Ag Point Source Program that I just described. And to be fair for ranking um, this competitive grant program, it's designed with three tracks. So a farmer and a district, if as they're getting through the planning process and they have priority systems developed, they would decide which track they would want to propose for. And then those projects would compete with each other. Just in broad strokes here, track one is focused around everything, alternative manure management and precision feed management. That's primarily to work on reducing uh, methane emissions from, from livestock farms. 
Um, track two is very broad and involves everything from related to adaptation and resiliency. So think, how can I become more durable or prepared for the effects of climate change, drought, flooding, um, you name it, soil erosion. Uh, track three, Healthy Soils New York, is been expanded to include not only sort of maybe conventionally what we think about practices for soil health, but also for agroforestry. In the first six rounds, we've awarded 20 million, um, around 240 farms and uh, 320,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent estimated emission reductions per year. Round seven is a big boost and that's um, in line with the recently completed Climate Action Council scoping plan of which our, our program priorities are aligned with the goals for those parts that are in the agriculture and forestry sector of that. As the same um, projects that have bubbled up through the AIM planning process are eligible, the districts are the local sponsor, it's competitive, there's an 80% cost share program uh, rate from the state, so 20% for the farmer, cash or in kind, and the program manager is Jennifer Clifford in our shop. And just to underscore um, AIM, it's technical elements, it's partnership elements, it's training elements, it's certification elements, and it's cost share elements, all the things that make it big picture AIM um, are often found in some of the states and local watersheds um, highest priority planning documents and programs. So I mentioned earlier, and I'll focus that and keep it at that, but AIM is central to meeting our um, greenhouse gas mitigation and carbon sequestration goals for the Ag and Forestry Center in the Climate Action Council scoping plan that was recently finished at the end of uh, 2022 there. And in the interest of time, I will say thank you. And, uh, and please do reach out. If you have bigger picture questions for me, you're welcome to call about anything. Um, but certainly uh, make a schedule an appointment with your soil and water conservation district to say, hey, how do I start? And you know, an expectation there, you're probably getting a sense is, is you know, we do, it's a methodical process of assessment and planning for a reason. So you get the highest value out of it and you get meaningful practices that you wanna operate and live with deliberately, right? Um, so as a result, oftentimes that first conversation won't result in, oh, let's go for cost share funding, but it'll, it'll get into the planning process. And I think um, uh, Becca will, will um, tell her story about that a little bit as well. So that I thank you, and I will switch over to Becca. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, let me get my screen shared here. I'll get things going. Excellent. Well, my name is Becca, and I, um, along with my partner Bill, own Bottomland Farm in Tioga County, New York. Um, we are a fairly small farm. We sell direct to consumer at four different markets um, a week during peak season, and we focus primarily on pasture raised livestock. Although we do some some veggie production and fruit production um, when we have time. Uh, so we started in 2016, so we're not very old. Um, and we started, um, just to give you an idea of kind of where we're located in the state, we're in the Owego Creek watershed, which um, drains into the Susquehanna um, and then the Chesapeake. So that's an important piece to our story and kind of where our farm is situated here. Um, this shows a picture of our property. You can see that we are located, the, the original piece of property is in the red square, and that was about 55 acres um, of mostly wooded hillside that was um, pretty steep and, and fairly unusable. So when we first started farming, we were trying to figure out how we were gonna best utilize this farm property while working with the natural elements that we had in play. Um, so we started with pasture raised pigs, we did shiitake mushrooms. We really tried to fit within the natural systems that were here. Um, luckily in 2019, we were able to double our acreage. Um, the green square to the north that you see is the additional acreage that we purchased in 2019 um, and added about 
50, or about 10 more tillable acres, um, along with um, about 50 more acres of wooded hillside um, that you can see. Um, you can also see that there's a stream that starts there and that drains into the east branch of the Oigo Creek. So we have a fairly wet area um, that we were working with at the time. This new property was primarily corn and soy um, for the last 50 or 60 years. It was originally um, farmed by a local dairy and then transitioned to um, a crop farmer that had been leasing the property until we had purchased it. So our goal was to transition this corn and soy property to more perennial um, and really focus on creating pasture that we could rotate our livestock on. So we called Soil and Water and we um, reached out and basically I, our, my original email was like, hey, we just bought this new property. What can you guys help us with? You know, are there resources that we can access for grazing through you? And the folks at Soil and Water were really, um, really helpful initially. They came out. They went through tier one and two and evaluated toward our farm, talked to us, really tried to understand what we were doing here and what we were hoping for, um, and created um, some assessments of, of kind of what our farm was and where, where we were at with things. Um, this is the list, I looked back at our tier two summary report, and this is the list of topics that they kind of focused on as they were walking around the farm. The ones in bold were the ones that were applicable to what our operation was doing at that particular point in time. And those bold items are what they built their plan off of for our farm. So um, it was a pretty easy, straightforward process. The information that they provided um, was easily accessible and we were able to have kind of an open communication about what we were hoping to gain from any partnership with Soil and Water um, and, and kind of where our farm was going. So after um, the, the tier two, they created a plan for our farm. Um, and you can see here, this is a map that was put together. Uh, the areas in green are the our native plantings. So it's kind of a buffer between the waterways and our pasture. Um, we were able to incorporate um, fencing, perimeter fencing for our fields so that we can more easily rotate our animals and feel more secure um, with our livestock rather than just rotating them in electric fence with no perimeter fencing. Um, and then we are also able to incorporate um, some water line as well and some frost-free uh, hydrants and waters for our livestock. That was a huge game changer. Prior to that, we were just hauling our um, water out to animals. So not only did it create efficiencies, um, but it really, this whole plan really created um, a holistic look at what our farm property was, was going to function as. So to get started, um, I'll go back real quick. You can see too, there's some um, water, some vernal pools that they had planned to dig um, as well in the buffer. Um, so not only were we looking at planting and restoring some native uh, trees and shrubs, but we were also hoping to create some additional vernal pools that would capture water, slow runoff um, from the hillside, and also create habitat for those native species that, that were around. So it took probably, let's see, we started conversations in 2019. Um, we were about ready to get the project started and in motion in 2020 when um, COVID started to happen. So things got delayed a little bit further. Um, and then we were finally, I think this was the fall of um, 2020 when we first started to dig the vernal pools. So Soil and Water had partnered with the Upper Susquehanna Coalition um, to come out and dig these vernal pools. They added some trees in there to create additional habitat for wildlife. They reseeded that area um, and they were able to create um, a really positive habitat from an area that had previously been wet and would not have been very usable for grazing. This past spring was kind of neat because um, those vernal pools did provide habitat. I found dragonfly nymphs. I was able to find um, salamander and frog eggs. So it was obviously something that helped to create additional biodiversity um, on our farm right next to our pasture. 
the next step for our farm project was to um, dig water line out to our pasture and install a pump house um, as well as a new well. We had been working on watering all of our livestock off of our, our house well, basically. So this adds a little bit more resiliency to our farm, um, not just in the fact that we can get the water easily to the animals, but we can also um, have a second well in case we had ever had any issues. After the well was, the water lines were installed and the well were, was dug, we installed um, some, our buffer planting. And our buffer planting actually included about four and a half acres um, of our property from the north end to the south end, right along the hillside where the water um, drains. And so we focused on planting four, I think it's four to five different um, species, native tree and shrub species um, in these tree tubes. And at Soil and Water hired a contractor to come in. They got the planting done all in one day. It was pretty amazing um, from one end of the, the property to the next. And they've come back um, with interns to survey to see what percentage of the trees have survived. Um, and we are just in charge of maintaining in between the trees and, and mowing twice a year, um, which we get some funding for through soil and water um, to cover our time and, and our um, fuel costs as well. Um, and then after the tree tubes or the trees were planted, we had finally had our fencing installed. Um, so it took a little bit of extra time due to supply chain issues, um, but we had about 10 acres of, of fields with perimeter fencing installed. Um, they initially had us uh, quoted for um, six strand high tensile, but we decided to use our funds um, personally to upgrade to the woven wire. So we were able to work with soil and water and use their plan and then kind of tailor that to what we really needed and what would work for us in the long run. So this is an aerial view of our um, north pasture. You can see um, on the right-hand side, the trees that are in shrubs that are planted along the hillside. You can see one of the um, vernal pools that's there. Um, and you can see our pasture rotation with our broilers and our turkeys um, and our goats in this, in this field right here, as well as our, our water lines with our gravel. Like I said, this has been an extreme game changer for us. It's been um, an absolutely huge um, help in terms of creating more efficiency, um, more security, and creating more biodiversity as well. So the overall results, like I said, it's created more efficiency on our farm. We no longer have to haul water. It's easier to rotate our livestock um, within the, the grazing plan that soil and water help to develop. Um, we have more peace of mind, as anyone with livestock knows. If you don't have perimeter fencing, you're always kind of wondering if they're out in the back of your head. So um, this has really helped to um, give us peace of mind and make sure that, that predators are excluded as well. Um, as you can see by the, the picture of the salamanders and the dragonfly nymphs, this has increased biodiversity and I expect that it will continue to increase biodiversity as um, the years go on and the trees and the shrubs um, really develop and grow older. Um, we've been able to improve our soil health just through the rotational grazing program and reduce erosion. As I said previously, this was corn and soy. Um, and it was corn and soy up until the edge of the field. So even where the trees in the wetter area had been planted, um, they were farming that as corn and soy. So we've, able, we've been able to kind of pull production off of that um, area um, and improve water quality, um, as well as, as increase carbon sequestration on our farm, um, turning from annual to perennial plants um, has been has been great. So it's it was a pretty quick, um, shouldn't say quick, it was a pretty easy process. Our soil and water district um, was able to communicate really effectively with us. And we had quite a bit of input um, or it, we had the ability to provide quite a bit of input as the plan was being put together and as the plan was being um, built. So we weren't stuck into any one thing um, and we were able to communicate with both the contractors 
and soil and water to really make it what we needed um, for our own farm, um, to really tailored to us. And then the last thing I'll say is that I've done uh, several other larger uh, grant projects on our farm. And this was by far one of the easier ones, even though it was probably the largest. And that was because of the support that the Soil and Water District provided. They coordinated the contractors. They coordinated a lot of the work that was done. They kept us in the loop the whole time. So we didn't have to chase down the contractors. We didn't have to worry about um, when they were coming because Soil and Water would tell us and inform us. Um, it was really, fantastic to have that support and that's not often the case when you're doing a larger project like this. Um, so I think that makes a huge difference um, when working with the soil and water district or when doing a big project um, is the connections in the community that you build with the district itself. Um, and it's continued. So even though this project finished we have continued to have a, a relationship with them. Like I said, they come out every year um, and double check things. If I have questions about something that might apply to, to an area that they cover, I can email, I can call, I can um, ask for information and they're able to direct me to somebody that um, can provide more information. So it's really been a fantastic relationship to build as we've been building our farm as well. Okay. That was pretty quick, but let's see, we have a question here. Um, so Elizabeth asked, it sounds like the soil and water district did a lot of work on your farm. How did you divide the work up? Well, hopefully I answered a little bit of that question. So soil and water actually coordinated all of the, the project. And since they've done this kind of project before, they knew that this work, that certain pieces of the work had to happen before others. Um, and so they were able to be the kind of logistical overview for how all of those pieces fit together. Um, so it was a kind of a whole system plan that they put in place after we did our evaluation. And then they were the ones that were able to really figure out what pieces needed to happen when, which was great because then we could focus on the farm itself. So there's another question. I don't, I, are these programs only for working farmland? And that's something that um, Greg would have to answer. I don't know, Greg, if you have a minute now or you wanna hang on to that question until later. How about we hang on that till later? Okay. I, I guess there'll be some other program related questions. I can bundle those. Excellent. Okay. Well, I can't recall if Lee or Klaus is next. I think Lee's up next. Okay, thank you all. Thank you, Becca. There you go, Lee. Yep. Hello, everybody. I'm Lee Braggs. I'm with the, uh, the Glens Falls Community Garden, mainly the Murray Street Garden. Um, in order to kind of get you where we are today, I guess I have to go back and, and kind of give you an idea of where we've been. And then you can get a, a sense of an idea of where we hope to, to, to eventually get to. Um, the Glens Falls Community Garden, uh, Murray Street, uh, we are the original community garden. It's been in existence. I don't know actually how long it's been in existence. It was there when I moved to the area, and that was 40 years ago. It was already there. So it's the original, I call it the grandfather of community gardens in the area. It was uh, established back when community gardens wasn't the popular thing to do when, we, when it comes to urban gardening. But since then, it was eventually, it was uh, originally oversaw by the Glens Falls Community Action Agency. And they saw, they oversaw it, they, the daily operations and everything that was connected with it. But eventually uh, the funding dried up. So quite naturally, uh, community action no longer participated. And that's where I came in. I, I moved here and I originally from the South and I was just used to having a, some type of vegetable garden in the backyard. And uh, we didn't have that here. So I got involved and got me a little, a little steak and the original community garden, Mer the original Murray Street Community Garden, which was on Staple Street, 
is that the, it was in the the, uh, the, uh, the area where there's a huge development now. And I knew it was just a matter of time with uh, uh, property being developed, especially in the, the city area, that it was just a matter of time before that property eventually would get developed. But the, um, the owners of the property assured me that that property would, would be available for community garden until such time that it, they did decide to develop it. And it was a huge area. It was actually almost two acres, a uh, big L shape. And um, so it did come that time. Property, just, and this is a few years ago that it, they decided to, to develop the property. And there went the community garden, the, the original grandfather community garden. And it was in a location that you could actually walk right in the middle of the city, but you could actually walk 50 feet from it and never knew it was there. It was the ideal location. And I thought that was the end of it once it, the, the area was developed. But the mayor stepped in, the mayor, mayor Hall at the time, with the city of Glens Falls, decided that this was a great idea and he wanted to maintain the Glens Falls community garden the original Glens Falls Community Garden. So we ended up walking around the city, uh, looking at some city-owned properties throughout the city. And the uh, most logical, I wanted to, to it was in the, uh, the fifth ward of the city that I, I kind of wanted to keep the, the garden in that area. So uh, we did come up with, uh, it's called the Murray Street Community Garden because it's the Murray Street Playgrounds. And uh, that's, it was a several locations we looked at in that particular area. And the area we decided on was right next to the road, which was not a bad spot, but I was concerned with uh, uh, people walking by and vandalism and that sort of thing. When you got something that's readily available and you just step off the sidewalk and there it is. But that was four years ago. So the first two years, of the community guard in a new location, which is Murray Street, there was no mishaps. But with the community garden going back a little bit now, uh, with uh, uh, community action not involved anymore, there's a matter of, there's funding that comes with everything. You, you need money to do stuff. And uh, there went that we could not get it tilted and they're trying to tilt two acres uh, way back when uh, without any funding it was quite expensive so that that all of that fell on me and i took a, i decided to you know i wanted to this was a good idea i love gardening and uh, so i would use my own funding and try to recoup my funds one way or the other which never happened so with you know with like i say with anything that comes that, that comes funding so the first two years on Murray Street, it was tough. It was actually tough when we just kind of scratched our way through. But after, uh, after a while, Warren County soil and water stepped in. And that's when everything started to happen, really started to happen. Uh, since then, the area, we had soil samples taken and, and I guess they weren't the greatest, but they weren't the worst either at that time. But uh, we, uh, Nick, as well as, uh, what's the name? Marin. Marin they uh, stepped in and we got did soil testing. And then we decided we're going to put in some raised beds. And, you know, they're affectionately known as the tubs around town, which is, you know, the, it's the type of raised bed it is. It looks like a tub. But uh, it was the best thing that we could have done in this past season. Uh, and the, where it's located now, is a high traffic area, foot traffic, uh, as well as road traffic. And uh, uh, it's downhill from the hospital. So a lot of people actually walk that stretch uh, for you know their lunch break or whenever they, that's the hospital staff, they do their walking in the area. So they've seen it and uh, everybody. So it was tough trying to get an interest in people in doing urban gardening because we was hidden and it was in an ideal location but now that it's out and people can actually touch, feel, see what's going on, everybody wants to get involved. <laughs> everybody, the, the people just walking by. So here's Warren County, soil and water steps in. 
And this is the greatest thing because all these years, I'm talking about 40 years or so of funding this thing out of my back pocket. And uh, which, you know, sometimes I recoup my money, sometimes I didn't. But that wasn't about, it wasn't about the money. It was about having a place for people to come together and grow vegetables, edible vegetables. So Warren County Soil and Water steps in and Nick and Meyer and, and, and I can't, I can't put into words, along with this, the, the mayor, the past mayor of City of Glass Falls, as well as the present mayor, and there are there they opt in. They're all in, and and with grants that we've received, and and uh, it's a much smaller area, but we can produce almost just about as much as we did, sort of in the larger area that we had. And future development, we hopefully we can uh, expand on that, put in more uh, raised beds eventually, uh, uh, do some fencing. Uh, there are still, I don't care where you have a, a garden, there's varmints that actually want to get at it. So we, we're probably going to eventually down the road get some fencing, we hope. And um, and just uh, it's because the existing, the existing um, raised beds that we had, uh, they've been, they spoken for already. They were spoken for last fall. People want them. So hopefully we can expand on that eventually. And there's a wooded area that hopefully we can push back and get some benches and stuff applied. And, uh, you know, a, a big thank you to for the city of Glens Falls for they stepped right in and, and, and had water actually piped right to the site. And uh, with hoses, they had supplied hoses and, and all of that sort of thing. And the grants that we got through one kind of soil and, soil and water, it just made the whole they, they spoil me, I guess. Uh, they just make the whole process so much simpler. And when I was just about ready to give up on the project. So, but we've come a long way. And, and it's, it's a lot happened in, in that 40 years. I, it was there 40, when I got here 40 years ago. I got involved over 30 years ago. And, and, we've, and we've come a long way since then. So I just, just owe a, a debt of thanks to the participants. Uh, Nick, as well as My Myron, uh, for all their dedication and seeing this project through. And and I don't know anything about writing grants, but the, the grants that we received, hopefully it holds the future. And getting and we're getting younger people involved. Before Community Garden, it was all about older individuals, but we, now we're getting young folks involved. So I'm looking forward to what the future holds for the Glass Falls and Murray Street Community Garden. Yeah, I guess I could give a, a little background on the project we teamed up with Lee on. Um, so when they were moved to Murray Street, um, we immediately uh, reached out to NRCS and um, Olga brought over her XRF, Trace Metal, and we got some numbers back that we weren't, um, they were just a, a little higher than we wanted. So what we were able to do, uh, we reached out uh, and that was in November 21. So in order to get the gardeners back going for spring of 22, um, we needed to work really quickly and figure it out and funding sources. So uh, we actually got some grants through uh, a local brewery here called Common Roots Brewery. Um, we were also able to team up and get some funding through the city of Glens Falls. Um, and also at our office at Soil and Water, we have a community garden program as well. Um, so we kind of scraped everything together. Uh, we followed some newly developed NRCS standards, put down a soil barrier, um, covered it with wood chips and built uh, 36 inch tall uh, raised beds. And we were able to install 11 of those um, to get the gardeners uh, up off the ground and into some uh, a very healthy soil mix. Um, and that's a, a little bit about the, the background of kind of how the, the project got installed so quickly. Um, so they were back at it gardening uh, come May 22. Um, so in a little over what, December, January, February, March, a little over four months, um, we were able to get everything built, which was really nice. Um, not sure if anybody has any questions. I think I saw a few in the chat. Um, I think you already answered the the main one, which was where you located in Glens Falls. 
Um, I think we can move along to class and then address any more questions that folks have towards the end. So as questions arise, don't hesitate to put them in the chat. I'll collect them and make sure we get to them. Thank you, Lee. You're welcome. So I'm Klaus Martins. I live in near Penyon, New York, and we're in the Yates County Conservation District. And I remember when I first started farming, I'd uh, go to other counties. And when you cross the county line, there'd be a sign entering Ontario County Conservation District or entering Seneca County Conservation District. And I never knew what that meant. You know, I, I realized that it was uh, obviously a government uh, or quasi government governmental entity. But then I was asked to go on the board of our local conservation district. And I was in for quite an education. And I had been aware of NRCS and uh, FSA right along because that's the normal interface for commercial farmers and the government uh, for doing conservation work. But then I found that there was a local entity, which was the conservation district, which was set up about the same time. This all goes back to the New Deal when we had the uh, disaster across the country, environmental disaster of dust storms and erosion, you know, farmers in financial dire straits. The government set up some very long lasting, very important programs. Now, one of them was the Natural Resources Conservation Service, which in those days was called the Soil Conservation Services Service. And they didn't just go out and tell farmers how to farm differently or how to save their soil. They actually put a tremendous amount of effort into education. Uh, they, the NRCS education uh, effort trained district conservationists and uh, soil conservationists in how to build diversion ditches correctly, how to put in strip crops correctly. Uh, what are the best practices for putting in drainage? What are the best practices for irrigation? And the whole range of, thing, of practices that farmers had to learn. And, unfor and at the same time, uh, there was these county groups were set up, which was the conservation districts, and that created local buy-in. Uh, a county conservation district has two, has a board of directors that uh, manages it, and they have uh, generally two of the directors are, are county legislators, and normally one director is, at least from a list nominated by the Farm Bureau, one other one is from a list nominated by the Grange. And then there are, there's a wider representation of the community and of the farmers who are on the district board. And at least in the case of Yates County, and I think the same is true for a lot of other counties, uh, there, this education that NRCS was doing was being spread. So the employees of the Yates County Conservation District would work with our district conservationists at NRCS and they got a tremendous education in how to do these, how to do the technical work and how to work with the contractors when projects were being conducted. So I'm, I'm hearing echoes of that in, from some of our other counties where the expertise that the conservation districts have is just tremendously useful for the farmers who they're working with. Unfortunately, the federal government stopped putting so much money into training district conservationists in the practices they needed. And we were very fortunate that at least in New York state, the conservation districts were there to take over in that role and uh, bring on new people and the existing ones train them. So that today, if we want to do field drainage, our uh, NRCS people are so overworked that it's the hit and miss if we're going to get help, but I can call the conservation district and they'll have two people who are very skilled and qualified who can come out and look at what we're doing and help us. Uh, the other thing that they're working with is they're working with our county highway departments. And when there are ditches that are washing out or when there's a natural disaster, they're providing the expertise for how do we rebuild this so that it doesn't wash out if we have another event like this. And uh, recently we had a local river where the banks were washing away 
And um, it was not, our conservation district didn't have the expertise, but they had a cooperating conservation district to the south of us who sent people out who had expertise in how do we stabilize these stream banks. And this is, <laughs> this has been just tremendously helpful to have people who know how to do this and who can share that expertise. Now this goes to another level with AEM. Uh, since the AEM program was instituted, our conservation district has increased in the amount of skill and the different kinds of skills that they have. So for instance, our uh, person that I work with the most is Tom Eskelson. He's a certified uh, farm planner. He's also a certified crop advisor. So he has expertise in cover cropping. He has expertise in conservation farming, reduced tillage, and he's got a good rapport with the farmers. And in our county, there is an underserved group. And you might not guess who they are. They're, they tend to be invisible, but they're Amish and Mennonite farms. And Amish and Mennonite farmers don't normally interface with the government very much. But Tom started knocking on doors and he became trusted and became a friend and started working with them and helping them. About this time when AEM started, our county had some tension. Uh, we were a big tourist area and the Farm Wineries Act was started in New York state and we have a lot of wineries. And you can imagine what kind of tension you have when there are a lot of dairy farms right next door to a lot of wineries. Uh, people don't especially like it when there's manure being spread next to the winery they're visiting. That tension was resolved with the help of our conservation district. And the AEM program was just made to order for Tom to be able to sit down with the farmers who had dairy cattle and advise them on how do we build manure storages how do we time our spreading? How do we improve our manure management practices so that it has the least amount of environmental impact? And at the same time, this was helping our uh, wineries and grape farmers who live next door. On the other hand, on the wineries and grape farms, the AEM program identified that there need to be safer ways to clean out sprayers to catch the wash water. Uh, there needed to be in a lot of cases, because vineyards are on steep slopes, better management, as especially as we started having harder rainfall events to prevent soil loss. And the conservation district has been, our conservation district has been very well supported. Our local county government has always been generous with their funding because they see the benefit that is going directly back to the taxpayers. But also New York State's been quite generous uh, with their funding. I think it would be well worth NOFA members to contact, as Greg's mentioned, contract, contact the, uh, the conservation districts if we're not already working with them to see what kind of services are available and to see how we could cooperate better. The AEM program is a very common sense, voluntary uh, type of approach. Uh, what Tom calls, Tom calls it looking for the low hanging fruit. So when we have the first stage of our AEM, when we're in tier one, we're identifying what are the biggest resource concerns and Tom is right away thinking, what are the ones that are the cheapest and the easiest to address? And we'll, we'll do those first. And when we get the biggest issues that are the easiest to address out of the way, then he'll start looking for money so that we can start approaching the next, the next layer of issues and it's an ongoing process and we as a community don't even realize how much work is being done and I think we all owe uh, a thank you to Ag New York State Ag and Markets, the New York State Legislature for the way they've supported the conservation districts. We certainly owe our counties, county governments a thank you uh, for the way they've supported them. So just a few words on how our farm has worked with Tom. We ended up owning a dairy farm as part of a much larger complex of businesses. And uh, that dairy farm had 
it was, you couldn't quite call it a manure storage. I think I would have called it a disaster uh, rather than a storage. And Tom came out and looked at it and agreed it was a disaster. And he uh, put in for funding. This was a very, it was a complicated project because in this particular case, they had just dug a hole at the end of the barn and let the barn cleaner dump into it. Uh, the groundwater was very high so that uh, you no sooner got it cleaned out when it was starting to fill up because of all the water that was running in it. And uh, the first thing we did was identified where was this water coming from, put in some drainage lines, and then when a round came up where we could apply for cost sharing, uh, Tom found us an engineer who could come out and look at the project and make a proposal. He found some funding to help us. Now, obviously, we had to pay for half of the cost, but it made it possible for us to do a much better job because there was funding available. And we didn't want to just put in a liquid manure slurry. That's uh, There was an issue on our farm, and that's closing the nutrient cycle. The land that was feeding the cattle on this dairy farm was further away, and we recognized that if you have liquid manure, there's a lot of weight. There's also the problem of the spreaders sloshing and getting manure on the road, which we have been dealing with. And what we designed was a separation. So there was a pad where the solids were separated out so that we could compost them. And then there was a drain system put in that would take the liquids to a um, concrete tank. And by separating the manure, we could keep the liquids close by where it was not so expensive to properly utilize them and haul the solids further back to the land where the rest of the feed that generated the manure came from. And we were able to do a good job, excuse me, of closing the nutrient cycle. Then Tom uh, came when we, incidentally, we're in an area where climate change is causing very frequent severe droughts more than we used to have so that we're having both more intense rainfall, but also longer and more intense drought periods. And we got a grant for improved irrigation. So now um, we haven't fully implemented this yet, but we're going to be able to pump the liquids that come out of the, uh, from the manure together with a large amount of water out onto the pastures and never have an issue of hauling that on the road again we've eliminated the risk of sloshing manure onto the road because the solids are being composted and there's no smell to deal with anymore uh, on that. So just a quick example of how the district can work with someone. The other thing uh, the district has done is where there are farms who are, are causing an issue. The farmers usually don't want to do so. It's usually out of just maybe poor planning, or maybe they bought a farm that had a problem. Uh, the district employees have been knocking on doors and saying, hey, are you aware that you've got a water quality issue here with say how your manure is being handled or something else they're doing? And because of their approach, it's become very cooperative. We're showing that cooperation and voluntary action can actually be more effective and go farther than regulation. And our, uh, our district is doing a good job of documenting that. And we have really come a long ways. We have very good cooperation and good rapport between the wineries and the dairy farms. The tourist industry has really benefited because of what's being done. And I'd say our community looks a lot more attractive because of good management practices that have been installed and we really owe our conservation district uh, a thank you for the help they've put in to those results. So I probably talked too long already, but um, open it up for any questions and for any uh, additional thoughts that Greg or um, anyone else has on this. Thank you so much, class. And thank you again, Lee and Becca. Um, these are really excellent portraits of some of the work that's happening. So really appreciate you sharing. Um, I 
so I'm going to take us back to the question that came up earlier, the one for you, Greg, about um, eligibility. Uh, let me find it. Are these uh, programs only eligible for working farmland? Um, so do you want to take that one? And then if anyone else has questions, pop them in the chat and I'll bring them forward. Absolutely. Thanks, Katie. And I just want to have a, a heartfelt thanks to Becca, Lee, and Klaus for those really eloquent descriptions of, of the work that you've done with the districts and, and on your farms. Um, so are these programs, let's let's kind of focus back to the, the thumbnail sketch that, that I provided of, of AIM programs um, only for working farmland. So with all of our programs within the AIM framework, like I showed a bit ago, um, we use a very high level uh, portion of a, a definition in ag markets law, which is essentially it's uh, an active farm and you know looks like a farm, has these attributes, just kind of some descriptors, um, and it operates as a commercial enterprise. And in our current um, interpretation of that, we really lean on that in a, and use that in a flexible, liberal way, so that you know that could. There's no threshold for sales, you know. We, barter could be in that in that mix as well. But keep in mind, this is um, these are focused efforts and focused programs with the word agriculture as the first, right? So it's it's intended for farms, but it's quite flexible within that. Um, you know, keep stay tuned for um, future clarifications and definitions on that as. You know, I think that the state in general um, develops um, better better guidance on on um, on, on um, you know maybe things associated with the Climate Action Council scoping plan as well. But there's a lot of a lot of room to operate and just you know start the conversation with your soil and water district. Your question though also made me think of, and there were a couple. Um, um, mentions of this with the farmers on the panel that districts do a lot of work outside of agriculture too in their community in the in the county that they overlap, and so they'll you know work on municipal conservation projects or um, you know just conservation projects in general that aren't with a private landowner and they're interested. They have expertise there, and you know like Lee really well described. If there's an opportunity there and it fits within the priorities and the timing of the staff at the district, you know they can do it and not just say to do it, but not be able to because they're too busy, right? Um, chances are they'll they'll ask some good questions. They'll work within the network. They'll see if there's a grant or some funding to to help, um, you know, accomplish your goals there. So it's always always good to ask a question, um, even if you know you're listening here today and you're thinking about land that maybe you have. Um, an interest in and, and it's not um, actively in farming right now. Um, would, you, would it be helpful for me to read out the questions for you, Greg? No, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm actually seeing them. I'm just- a, Okay, perfect. Yeah, thanks, Katie. Um, there's one from Elizabeth. For farmers who might be shy about getting in a board like the district, is there anything, is there any training to help folks get up to speed? Okay, so I think this is asking about if, um, you know, a, a farmer or a community member would like to join a soil and water conservation district board, um, you know, that, that would, board meetings or public meetings and the district manager, there's websites, you can contact, you can reach out and ask these questions. And, you know, when there's an opening, you know, that could very well be a possibility. And then once on a board, um, there's absolutely uh, annual training um, uh, uh, modules that help you know, someone who's in a local leadership position, but new to maybe you know, overseeing a, a district, uh, um, a soil and water district as a director and to help them understand you know, that system now that they're, they're charged with with, with helping to lead. And I see Klaus coming off mute there and he is a director, so uh, please layer in. Uh, I, I could speak for the Gates County Board. Uh, we're always looking for 
prospective new members of the board uh, because we've we've used the board members for their expertise. You know, having having a good group of board members from a diverse group of backgrounds makes the board more effective. And uh, we also really like to have guests. It's amazing how how seldom we have guests at our board meetings because uh, people just don't seem to know about them, but they are public meetings. The minutes are public. You know, everything we're doing is for the public and uh, visible to the public. At least uh, we try to make it visible if, if anyone wants to be there. Yeah, yeah, and thank you, Elizabeth, for following up. Uh, she's echoing your, your comment, Klaus, there about, um, if I misinterpret that, I'm sorry, Elizabeth, about, you know, hey, maybe I'm interested in board. Maybe I just want to learn more about what the Soil and Water District does. Yeah, absolutely. Um, board minutes um, and, and just um, scheduling an appointment and, and having a meeting um, and, and, and engaging with this community group, right? And I should say that too. I mean, you know, there's there's a lot of interest in agriculture and conservation, and you know, new groups coalescing. You know, farms that are getting together to organize around uh, apprenticeships and whatnot. You know, any of these organizations, if you know, um, you know, think about the meeting topics over the course of the year, and definitely include a soil and water district. Give them a call and say, hey, can you just come over and present on on what you do and how we interact and it's a great way for different community groups, districts, and other farming groups to, to understand their interests and um, build the collaboration. I can answer the question on overlap between uh, well-managed farms and organic. Um, you, most of organic farming is about best management practices, and you don't have to be certified organic to use good practices, but there's a tremendous overlap in what these best management practices are. So. You know, I found that our district is very works as equally well with organic and conventional farmers, uh, and I, I, it's hard to overstate the value of the public relations and the bridge building that our district employees are doing. I'd like to mention three other things that it, that districts do that are valuable. One is when you qualify for ag value assessment, it's the soil and water conservation district who goes through your soil forms and fills them out for the assessor so that you get the tax deduction for uh, being a farm on your land. And that's a really valuable service uh, to the farmers. And another thing that districts can do is they can lease and make available equipment for conservation. So way back when nobody had no-till planters in our county, our conservation district bought a no-till grain drill and they would lease it to farmers. And they jump-started that practice in our area. And that, again, that, that was a very proactive um, and effective way. And uh, our district right now has just bought uh, mowers to control weeds under the trellis in a vineyard. One of, the, one of our grape farmers was very progressive and she said, you know, there's a different way to manage the weeds under the trellis and we don't have to be spraying them. Uh, we could just mow them off. So the district actually went and found a company in Europe that made the right equipment, ordered it, brought it over and is making it available to farmers to be rented by the acre. And, you know, these are things that a farmer wouldn't stick his neck out on an unknown practice and spend a lot of money on a machine, but the district has legal right to do that and it's another way that the district's effect, effectiveness is extended. Klaus, those are good comments that, that bring a, a thought that I, I meant to mention on my slides. Often I get the question about, hey, can these programs fund equipment? And the answer is yes, but there are details, right, that you can, you can unpack with your district if you're at that stage of a project. In other words, you know, you've assessed and planned and yep, everybody's in agreement, this is what I want, let's do this, great plan, I, we've honed it, it's ready to go. Um, the Climate Resilient Farming Program is a little more flexible given how it was framed and, and the, the law that ba it's based in. And that can be if the equipment is necessary for those practices that, are, that were awarded, 
you know, that equipment can then be a part of, of, of the farm's operation after the, after the project is over. Uh, there's another model for that as well, though, and sometimes this is a better decision from more of a community aspect, and that's the one that Klaus described, where, um, yeah, we need it for this project, or maybe it's a multiple farm project, and it makes the most sense that it's housed centrally so that many farmers can use it and not a property of the farm that was as a part of that grant. And that's where the soil and water district uh, would be the uh, owner and controlling um, agent of, of that piece of equipment. So there's options, right? And it's just all the best answer comes through communication. Um, for the Agnon Point Source Program, that's a little more of a narrow band. Uh, still, equipment can be um, a part of the project if um, it's needed for the implementation of those best management practices. But if it's something that's mobile and not sort of fixed with the project, so a pump that's on wheels versus a pump that's anchored, for instance, um, that may just have to be part of the landowner match. So it wouldn't be part of the state's cash award, but but the cost share of the, the, uh, from the farmer could be satisfied with that. Well, there's a question about if you don't get funded. And what I've found is that yeah. if it's a project, especially if something that's really needed or that could make a big difference, uh, time doesn't give up very easily. Our, our district doesn't give up too easily and they'll, they'll put it back through and they'll keep putting it through until it gets funded. And if it's something they really believe ought to be getting funded, it, they'll see to it that they find a way to get it funded. Uh, also for farmers that don't have a lot of money, um, they can do an in-kind like labor or some of the construction work can be credited as the farmer match. Mm -hmm. And again, I've found our, our people are very good at helping lower income farmers qualify by, by letting them do some of the work and you know having that become their match. I just wanted to touch on a couple of things you all have said, you know, as, as far as the funding piece goes, I know that our project when it, it was initially planned didn't have an obvious funding source, but the conservation district, I mean, the soil and water district kept looking for a way to fund it and eventually landed on something. So I think keeping that line of communication open um, and keeping that relationship there is really important. And then as far as the equipment goes, again, we were, beginning farm, new property. It had been in corn and soy rotations. We didn't have equipment to be able to seed it into perennial pasture. And that wasn't part of the funding that we received, but we were able to rent the no-till drill from our um, soil and water districts to be able to do that and to be able to turn it into pasture um, as quickly as possible. So that was a huge asset. And I think knowing what equipment your soil and water district has um, or, or what resources it has available, it's worth a conversation with them or a phone call. I just thought of so something that wouldn't come to mind normally. Our conservation district every year does an educational program called the Conservation Field Day where all of the schools, uh, generally at middle school age students come out and they actually get some hands-on, uh, a look at a, far a real farm, some demonstrations and hands-on uh, connection. And I still remember 60 years ago being in middle school and going on conservation field day and it made a real impression. And it, it taught us more about what kind of services soil conservation uh, is was doing in the county, but it's it's a good outreach too for non farming uh, families to be able to learn about what's uh, what's involved. You know that's a great point. And uh, if if anyone on the phone is associated with uh, young people looking for a really fulfilling career, keep a district in mind. <laughs> <laughs> We're in an all hands on deck moment here, right? And uh, hopefully not a moment, hopefully sustained. A um, lot of good progress to date and a, and a lot yet to do. And it's a tremendous education and working for a district where you've got older technicians who have great experience and who have learned a lot of these things. Uh, somebody could pick up some extremely valuable skills while working for a district. Um. 
Let's see, uh, I see one more question in the chat and we are a little over time. So I think um, after this question, we'll wrap up, but uh, could this be a role for NOFA to help introduce more kids to farming? Well, that might be a question for me since I'm with NOFA <laughs> or, or maybe if Bethany's on. Um, I think that's a great idea, Priscilla. I think we should, we should talk more about how NOFA can be a facilitator um, to more of these resources and getting folks involved. Um, any final thoughts from any of our panelists uh, or any final questions from the audience before we say good night? All right, lots of thanks in the chat, lots of gratitude. Um, thank you everyone for being here and a special thank you to our presenters. Um, and, and thanks to anyone on here that stuck it out for a bunch of workshops in the conference. It's been fun. Thank you. All right, have a good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you, everyone.